Well, hello there. So good to see you. So glad you're back for another sketch session. Before I start talking too much, I'm going to make sure that I actually see myself on the other screen. So knowing that I'm actually live. So give me just a few seconds. I hope you had a great day. I, I hope you're ready to just kind of let loose and, and have fun among the sheets, among, among the white pages. Okay. I see myself there and yes. Okay. Excellent. So we're on. Um, well, first things first, if you're here for the first time, welcome. It's so great to have you. My name is Carolyn Peters and I'm the owner of Kira Studios. And so I focus on teaching traditional drawing techniques. So artists like you probably um, can find their artistic voice and then explore their artistic voice while feeling like they're on, on solid ground. So I do these weekly sketch sessions where I rotate subject matter and I rotate focus. And the idea is it's a place for you to report to. It's consistent. It's always there. It's kind of like a gym. There's a coach there who has the lesson prepared for you. All you have to do is show up and do the work. And so I say it's kind of like a gym, but it's kind of like training ground and playground at the same time. I don't want to take ourselves too seriously, but I do like bringing a very succinct focus to every practice session because that's how we grow. If you just keep doing whatever we do, um, all over again, we just ingrain those old habits. And if we want to get better, we kind of have to push ourselves and, and focus on concepts that are maybe new or challenging. So today, um, I cycle through these four um, subject matters. I cycle through figure, portrait, animals, and then just inanimate things. And this week is a figure drawing week. But we're focusing, we're bringing the focus, the attention only to one body part, and that is hands. So beautifully complex, beautifully expressive, beautifully avoided by many of us. And so um, I have a bunch of images lined up for us. I have a bunch of one minute hand imagery, and I'll show you how I approach um, the hand if I only have really short amount of time. And then we'll roll into a 10 minute and some 15 minute poses where you can um, talk about structure and um, the individual anatomical segmentations that I kind of go through in the back of my head. And um, anytime you have questions as we draw, um, pop them in the chat and I'll happily address anything. Um, also, if you're just here to draw from the hands, you can put me on mute and just, you know, Focus on whatever it is that you want to focus on. This is your time and you want to make it fun for yourself. So with that said, as I said, so I'm going to hit the play button on our on our model reference and I'll talk as we draw. So let's dive in. Let me change my cameras. Just a quick second here. Transition. OK, let me make a mark here so I know it's focused. All right, so far, so good. Um, give me just one more minute. I'm gonna look over on the left so I can actually see everything on the other computer as well. But, okay, there we go, perfect. So I'm gonna hit play here. So when I only have a minute, we're gonna dive right in. <laughs> no rest for the wicked. When I only have one minute, I focus on the gesture. Now, what is the gesture? It's the big picture. It's like when I zoom out, what dominant rhythms do I see? Um, I'm not focusing at this phase on details such as fingernails or wrinkles or any of that stuff. I'm interested at what makes this hand characteristic. So what do I need to do physically to allow for that to happen? I need to um, zoom out. I need to look at the reference in a way where I see the whole pose in one glance. All right, next pose. So here, and I always like to begin coming down the lower arm and then observe how that movement from the lower arm visually connects into the hand. So right now, this here is just kind of a flowy curve um, connecting arm to hands, 
if I handed this drawing to somebody, they had no idea I'm drawing a hand. They just see kind of a rhythm, right? And um, the next thing I will look for is grouping, grouping fingers, um, grouping parts of the hand into um, containers, so to speak. So these three fingers, I'm grouping them together as one. Now, especially for a pose like this, um, I will look at what's called the enveloping shape. Like if I pretend like I have a bunch of straight sticks that I put around the outside of this pose, what shape would I get? So again, it's called the big enveloping shape. And then if I have extra time, I'll try to find some key um, signifiers like this knuckle range, the next knuckle range, the, the, the shape of the thumb. And one minute's are quick, so I might not get to it very much. Let me scoot this over again. So coming down from the arm into the hand. So forearm into hand into the fingertips. So this is again called the line of action, the dominant rhythm, connecting one, bar, one body part to the next body part to the next body part. And then looking for maybe the large enveloping shape as well as some characteristics. So I said in the intro, hands are beautifully complex and it takes a lot of practice um, remembering the different body, uh, different hand portions um, so you know what you can simplify. So in these gestures, in these crazy fast poses, stay visually zoomed out. Um, gestures aside from, you know, really um, being put to task and deciding what's essential, they're also just a great warm up. Um, exercise. So, you know, I've had a pretty full day with a million things to do. I'm sure your day wasn't any different. Um, and it takes some time to switch over into our uh, more creative drawing <laughs> oriented brain. So like that here, what kind of hand drawing is that? Um, I think let me just check real quick. Okay, so this one is our first 10 minute pose. So now we're slowing down. And actually, let me just pause this real quick so I can um, tell you what I'm thinking about. So when I draw hands, let's talk about some anatomical segments. So we have the lower arm, we have the wrist section. So in here we have a bunch of pebbly bones. Then we have the metacarpals, which they're basically the palm of the hand. Then we have our digits, the phalanges. And see how all of this is in line. So I have one, two, three, four segments that all line up. And then we have this one rebel over here, the thumb shooting off into a different area. So for that, we wanna have the thumb pad, and then we need two phalanges. So this here, you have three segments per finger, one, two, three. Um, for the thumb, you only have two phalanges. Now on the back of the hand, again, you have your lower arm, then you have this transition area, which is your um, carpals, um, again, your wrist, essentially. Then you have the back of your hand, your digits, th 
thumb offshoot and the digital of the thumb. So the reason why I paused, because it's so useful to be aware of these one, two, three, four, five, six parts, because then when you draw, you can account for them uh, by checking if you have shapes or forms in place for them. So I wanted to say that, so let's get into the drawing again. Now, if you've been drawing with me for a while, oh, by the way, I didn't say welcome back if you're a regular. Um, glad you're here. But if you've been drawing with me for a while, you know that I'm very big on having a process. Phase one of the process is the gesture. In the gesture, we record the big picture. Phase two of the drawing process is structure. This could be flat structure or three-dimensional structure. And then phase three is finishing. There we go. Sorry, I was trying to get that um, bar to disappear. So phase three is finishing. So this is my first phase. Uh, I'm establishing proportionate proportions at this point. So now my next phase is thinking about structure. And I'll begin by clarifying, okay, my wrist. How many planes of the wrist do I see? And I have my, sorry, I should have used a different word. How many planes of my lower arm do I see? Then I get my little wrist segment. Now that I have that, I'm thinking about my thumb pad and I'm thinking about the segments of the thumb itself. So I'm basically doing a lot of under drawing work here. For the fingers, since they're grouped together, like I don't have individually um, visible fingers, they're kind of acting as a block. I'm interested now in the structure of that block as a whole not so much the individual fingers to begin with. In terms of muscles, we have this big pad underneath the thumb is called the thenar group. Then by the little finger side, it's called the hypothenar group. Um, they're all kind of teardrop shaped. So now I've accounted for the parts that I have. Um, now I'll break up this little area into segments. So I'm thinking, okay, um, first phalange, second phalange, and it's actually, I have my students draw little dots in the areas where the joints are. And you don't want to rush this phase of placing the length and direction of your phalange segments. Because we have assumptions, and as you know, our assumptions, they always get us into trouble. And we assume that things are one way, and in reality, they're different. So I'm paying close attention to, okay, are they really parallel with each other, or is one angled differently from the other? Are they really the same length, here, 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 or is one appearing shorter than the other? Okay, once I've done this, um, so I like to think of this as pipe cleaners um, on the inside of the hand. Then I um, work a little bit more on the form. I'm starting to think, okay, these are all cylinders. Fingers are cylindrical. So the thought exercise is this. It's a little bit macabre, but if you've been drawing with me, you know this about me by now. The thought exercise is that you, you slice through um, the area that you're interested in perpendicular to its axis. So this is the axis of this little digit. I slice through it perpendicularly and would I see the face of the cut or not? See, and what happens now is I get a clear sense of how 
this finger is behaving in space. And I do it with the next finger. When you draw hands, especially when you're just focusing on practicing hands, I recommend you draw big because they are so complex. And sometimes complexity is hard to capture in really tight, small drawings. Paying close attention to how the end points here align with each other. And even though this index finger is kind of hidden, I still um, draw it. So you want to think about drawing as if things are made out of glass. You can see behind and through things. Let's get into that thumb. So that thumb is almost boxy. So rather than throwing a, an ellipse around as a wrapping line across contour, I'm thinking about the plane changes. But then here for the lower portion, I'll think in terms of ellipses again. Now the next thing about the hands is you want to, in your drawing, differentiate between what is the back of the hand and what is the underside of the hand. Because the back of the hand is more bony. We only have skin over bone there, maybe some tendons. And the underside is where it's all padded and muscle and fat and skin are all kind of bunching up. And so the best way to signify the difference is by using more curvy lines on the underside and then artificially straightening out your lines when you draw the back side of the hand or the back side of the fingers. Another thing about hands, this is totally obvious, but sometimes when we draw, we forget about the, the obvious, obvious things. Uh, our fingers are widest at the joints. So when you draw them, make sure that your drawing is widest at the joints. You know, often I'll have students tell me, well, but it looks so rounded at the back of the hand. Why would I draw it? Why would I not draw it the way I see it? Like, why do you want me to draw this kind of angular when I truly see it as rounded? And again, my answer is because we're not copy machines, we're artists and our job as artists is to clarify, to clearly, uh, clearly translate um, what's happening rather than blindly copying. Because what, what we accept in nature and in a photograph, we often won't accept it in a drawing. So see, I'm, what, in terms of where I'm at in my drawing, I've been thinking about the three-dimensional structure. Now I'm working on the contours.
Um, bummer. Well, the next drawing, these are 15 minutes now, so you'll have more time to draw the next one. So phase one, gesture. What's the overarching direction? What's the overarching rhythm? And then from there, start to flesh out that dominant line of action into shapes, more representative shapes. So look, my fingers at this point look very crude, um, really just like these little wires, um, but they're not drawn haphazardly, they're drawing, drawn carefully. All right, so now that I have my gesture, I get into shape segments. And you don't have to do this on the drawing, but uh, I recommend you do very lightly. So I'm doing this super faint, so you might not, able, might, might not be able to see it, let me press a little bit harder than I normally would. So I'm thinking, okay, here's the end of my arm. Then here is that section of the wrist. Now the reason why I pay so much attention to the section, because it's usually forgotten, because um, but you don't want to forget it, because look at this. If you have a regular pose like this, this feels short. But if this bends, notice how much longer this now became. So this part of the hand um, gets either really short or really wide. So that's why you want to take a moment and take stock. How big is this in this pose? Back of the hand. And now individual digits, individual phalange segmentations. And I like to first look at my knuckles and create an arc for the knuckles kind of keeps me on track in terms of proportions. Okay, but well let's go phalange by phalange. Close attention to length and direction. New direction. New length. New direction. Much shorter. So is this really how short I want it? And let's bring this over here. If anything I say, um, you'd like me to elaborate on it, or if you have a question around it, you can put any questions in the chat and I'll address them towards the end, or if I see them. So again, direction and length, dot for the joint, direction and length, dot for the joint. Actually, this is steeper down. Now, if you're just joining and you're looking at my drawing and you're thinking, well, I thought we were going to draw hands and she's drawing this really strange wire drawing. This doesn't look very fun. Why would I bother drawing something like this? It doesn't look pretty. If, if, if you're thinking anything along those lines, um, yeah, it's not pretty. And it's also not very satisfying to slow down and go through this process of kind of plotting out where things are. I'd much rather be doing contours and shading and stuff. But I also know from experience, from painful experience, that if I don't um, do my due diligence, that before I know it, I'll have really wacky proportions and uh, I'll bite myself in the end. So I'll, I'll, I have come to really appreciate one, two, three, four, five, a good process. Okay, so at this point, things are still fairly flat, right? Fairly two dimensional. So now I'm rolling into part three of my process building form. So part one is gesture, part two is shape, part three is getting into form. So 
So how do we build form? Mm -hmm. We need a few tools. Plane changes are great tools. A plane change is where the direction changes. See, this little part of the hand faces this way. This part of the hand faces the other way. So here, if I really had to make a decision, is where I'm placing my plane change. Top of the hand ends, side of the hand begins. And here these little ovals are my just my placeholders for knuckles. And now I can get into the cylinders for the fingers. Now when I build my cylinders, that's also kind of getting into um, shape in a way. I'm deciding how thick am I going to make any given finger. And kind of tiptoeing, not tiptoeing, that's not the right word, but like inching your way um, toward a finish in this very structured, organized drawing process um, affords me many opportunities to pause and assess where I'm headed. If I like where I'm headed, if I, um, like it'll let me catch early on or early enough on if I have like a proportion issue someplace. Okay, so see, um, now I have my 3D structure doesn't look very fancy, but it doesn't have to look very fancy. It just has to make sense to you. And so now I switch into contours and differentiating um, more angular contours for the backs of the hands with more curvy contours for the underside of the hand. And I'm also really being clear now on overlaps. So this is where understanding anatomy is really, oh my God, worst pun ever, comes in really handy. Um, here it goes. Um, but like knowing that these tendons go to these knuckles, see this tendon sits in front of that part. So our tendons, what they are, they're these little pulleys, they're these little rope pulleys that attach to whatever it is that they want to pull. So when I hit a joint, I make an effort to flare out my line so it doesn't look flush with the rest of the phalange. And I'll address that on the next finger a little bit more clearly. So straight angles, straight angle. And see, now I'm getting to the joint. So rather than drawing it like this, um, like this, I'm drawing it or I'm flaring out a little bit. Flaring back in or tucking back in. So it's not really doing that but it helps get that more finger-like quality. Um, so since I have a lot of underdrawing happening, I do like to erase my underdrawing at this stage. If I have time to get into light and shadow, I'll work over it with light and shadow.
a rounded curvy pad. joints, thickest area. So see how I had my little oval here um, giving me the placement for the knuckle part. So now that I come down the length of the phalange, I then know where to place uh, that contour for the knuckle. So I'm technically kind of going from my structure phase, starting to ease into the finishing phase. And so finish, let's talk about that real quick. Finish does not mean detail everywhere, value every, everywhere. Finish means bringing attention to the area that you had in mind in the way that you had in mind. So that can mean you have in mind only drawing a contour drawing. Or you could have in mind um, beginning with a contour drawing and seeing if you can add some tone. But that intention will guide where you're gonna go with the drawing rather than um, just haphazardly kind of flailing through the drawing process, not really knowing what it is that you want from your drawing. And also therefore not really knowing when you're finished. That's the problem, you know? I think um, it's a very common thing that happens where like you start something, you're crazy inspired, but then you're kind of in the middle of the drawing and you don't really know if you're finished. And the reason why you don't know if you're finished is because you don't know what your drawing is about. And it doesn't have to be about like some earth shattering insight or anything. It just can be, you know what, this drawing is about these two veins popping out. And then you can evaluate your drawing. Well, now that I look at my drawing, uh, and like you look at it with some detachment ideally, is that the area that my eyes want to go to? Or are there other areas in the drawing upstaging it? And if that's the case, then you know what to work on. You know that your job will be to downplay certain areas and upplay the area that you had in mind. And once people tell you, oh, the first thing I look at in this drawing, it's those two veins, they just pop out, they're so intriguing, how satisfying. Uh, once that's happening, then you know your job is finished. And in case you've been working on something, and this of course holds true for anything else as well, not just hands, but if you've been working on a drawing and you're saying, okay, Carolyn, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I need to get back to what this drawing is about. But then you're having a hard time detaching from it. Like you can't kind of see it without getting all judgy on it. And not judgy in a good way, but like judgy in a way where it's just like, this sucks, or I hate this. I don't want to keep drawing on this. Um, like here are some tricks. Um, turning it upside down is a really great way of um, being able to see your drawing in an objective way. So if you turn it upside down, walk away from it, and then you look at it and you're asking yourself, where do I look first now that it's upside down? If it's not the place you want people to look first, then you know that you have work to do. Another thing you can do is um, looking at it in the mirror. And now with cell phones, you can also just take a picture with your cell phone and Look at it like that. So when when you're just doing an exercise, like, you know, these, these drawings that we're doing, they're not artwork. Um, I mean, yours might be, but mine, I'm just looking at them as exercise. Just, you know, a chance to draw something. You gotta be clear with what's like what would be a successful 
outcome for these exercises? What is it that I want to focus on? Do I want to focus on how to use my materials to the best way? Do I want to focus on um, my drawing process? Do I want to focus on, I don't know, anatomy? Like, do I, do I want to study bones and, and muscles? It's like, whatever it is you're focusing on, have that in the forefront of your mind. So later on, at the end of your drawing session, you can feel like you can assess, oh, did I, did I accomplish my goal? Or ideally, you'll do that mid drawing session. Let me double check real quick how long we have for this one. This is a 15 minute pose. Okay, so I begin with my gesture. So gestures, again, connecting individual parts into a whole, seeing the big picture. So I'm connecting forearm, palm, fingers. Now that I have this, I account for my parts. So here is where I'm gonna put the end of my forearm. Here's where I'm gonna place my wrist pebbles closely overlapped by my thumb offshoot. And replace, reposition that thumb shape more over here. Drawing the shape for the palm. Deciding how long this needs to be. I'm now getting into individual phalanges, but before I do this, so we always want to work general to a specific, right? So I'm checking, I like this angle, I like this angle, I like this angle, but I do want to make sure that I have a good envelope so I don't get fingers that are crazy long. And so I'm connecting, okay, the, the, the tip of the thumb, tip of the thumb to the index finger, what angle do I see here? Again, it's called the big enveloping shape. Okay, so now they have that can come back to the individual um, segments. So I go direction and length, joint. Direction and length, joint. Direction and length. So they're all in line here. Next one. These are almost parallel. Let me find my knuckle arc. Next knuckle arc. That's a funny word, knuckle arc. <laughs> uh, okay, so joint is here. Joint is here. Tip is here. Let's look at the negative space in between the fingers here. angle is different. So see, obviously, um, this angle is different from that angle. The length is different too, comes all the way down to here before I hit the joint. Now, this is an important one. This is angled differently. So this and this are two sets of angles. And then joint to fingertip. Length and angle, length and angle. So it's easy to get freaked out by hands because they are pretty complex. 
But that's why as artists, we want to remember that we have these tools, you know, we have these ways of abstracting what it is we're looking at. So rather than saying finger, ring finger, um, you can think, well, what is the length and what is the angle? What's the direction? That's so much more approachable than, oh, it's a ring finger. So since these fingers are pretty much flush with my line, uh, with my picture plane, um, well, this one might come at me a little bit. Let me backtrack. They are coming at me a little bit. So rather than them being like this, the tip is pointing at me just slightly. So I'm going to draw these little cross contours here indicating that. This is pointing away from me. So when it's pointing at me, I'm going to draw this big so you know exactly what it is that I'm doing here. When the finger is pointing at me, I arc my wrapping line up like this. Like this is my, this is the closest edge of my imaginary rubber band. And then on this finger, it's going the other way. I'm emphasizing this arc going down. So don't going down if it moves away from me. Arcing up if it's coming at me. I got the lengths off here. Let's push this back here. Because I have my envelope. I don't want to push it beyond my envelope. So the only way to make this feel longer is by pushing this finger up higher. So sometimes you create an underdrawing. And then as you're drawing, you realize, oh, there's something wrong with my underdrawing. And rather than, than freaking out over it, telling yourself all kinds of non-helpful things, like I'm not good at drawing or I'm not a real artist, I get my underdrawing wrong. Um, you just make this part of the process. Like yeah, of course the underdrawing is wrong sometimes. It's the underdrawing is my first pass. It's the first pancake. You know how when you make pancakes, your first pancake it always kind of sucks because you, you're not dialed in yet. Okay, so you've got my underdrawing now fairly decently established. Let's do some contour work. So contours, of course, are the outer edges. And look, when I, when I get into detail areas, um, I grip my pencil really close to the tip as I get more control like that. Um, for the fingernails, I'm gonna draw the top and the bottom edge, I'm not gonna draw the full length of it because sometimes when you enclose your fingernail nails in a full enclosed shape, it kind of looks cartoony. So um, you might wonder why 
is the why, why are these hand poses timed? Why don't we just like draw for a really long time on one single pose and really, you know, get good at that. Um, and the reason is because I'm looking at these sessions as practice sessions, not as finished product producing sessions. And you learn more when you're pushed to make decisions. And so having a reference up for only a certain amount of time really forces you to choose. Is it this way or that way? And then the time runs out and then you throw your drawing away. Um, just because, you know, it, it was about making the choice. It was not so much about making the drawing, if that makes any sense. Sometimes you get a really good drawing out of it and then you can celebrate that and share it with friends and, you know, just tell everybody that it always happens that way. <laughs> that every time you sit down, you get a good drawing. But you know this, you know, it's just, um, if you play the piano, my parents, they, they encouraged me and my sister to play the piano when we were young. And of course, just like most children, we had no interest. We had little interest, not no interest. We had little interest in the piano. And so we never practiced. And so we never got any good, you know. But the people who are really into something, who are really into playing piano, um, they all sit down and they, they practice their scales and whatever else you practice when you play piano. I wouldn't know because I stopped. <laughs> I picked up pencils instead. It was much more fun. Like they all sit down and practice drawing hands, for example, without any drama. Nobody has to cry. Like these practice drawings are a little bit like these um, sand mandalas uh, that I think it's Tibetan monks who make them. You know, they take such great care and they make them, and they, then at the end of it, they just wipe it right back away. So, you know, not like these drawing, um, these exercise drawings will look as beautiful as a sand mandala, but it's the same idea. You know, once it's done, once the pose is over, you wipe it away. Moving on, next one. So here's something that I like to work on for myself, like this making quicker, quicker decisions, um, stylize, not stylizing more, but like, you know, leaving more things out, um, making a dark statement sooner rather than later with confidence. What I mean, see, this looks still stumpy. I wonder why, like it looks like a funky, funky finger. see what happened here. So that should be higher up. So one of the artists who's really great at making these um, strong statements right from the get-go, of course, because she's a master, is Claire Wendling. So very linear way of drawing most of the time.
but something that I would aspire to. I'm not there by no stretch of the imagination, but that's something I look at. It's like, ah, oh, that's the, you know, it's so useful. It's so good to have benchmarks, something to just aim at. So this will be our last pose for the evening, last 15 minute pose. And of course, the reason why a person like her is so awesome, so good at what she does, is because she draws all the time. And I don't think there's a moment where she doesn't have a, a pencil nearby. All right, so just as earlier, my drawing process is the same. Gesture first, establishing the big picture. Establishing the big outer angles. So at this point, I'm making sure um, that all my relationships are accurate. The way this tip relates to this tip, the way this tip relates to this knuckle, that these two relate to each other. So that's what I'm paying attention to right now. Okay. Now that I have that, let's talk segments. Anatomically based segments. So that wrist bump, you might notice that that's a very prominent landmark that wrist bump tells you where the end of your forearm is and then whatever is beyond it that's actual wrist bones so wrist bump actually belongs to the arm then you have wrist bones and then you get the palm and back of the hand and it's a nice um, or useful thought to think of this palm of the hand as a curved sponge, you know, like the kind of sponge you'd use to clean your dishes with. When, you know, when they dry up, they often dry with a curvature to them, kind of like that. Um, that's the, the, the 3D structure of your of your palm. Then I like to get my knuckles. Let's move this up here. And again, I'm placing them very mindfully. I'm not just gonna quickly, hectically laying them in. I'm paying close attention to how big are they and how close are they together to each other. Now that I have that, I get phalange segment to phalange segment, length and angle. Now, I'll, I'll make another pitch for why doing these kind of focused hand exercise drawings is so useful. It's, it's not because we then sit down and draw hand portraits and, you know, um, 
feel all accomplished about having now more beautiful hand portraits. It's really a way to familiarize yourself with the characteristics of the hand. And that's useful because when you then sit down next time to draw a person, you can filter what you've absorbed in your practice session into a shorthand. Um, again, that, that was no pun intended, like into a reduced down, boiled down version of the hand, not looking stereotypical like, you know, that kind of a symbolic shorthand, but a shorthand that is now based on um, what you what you realized as you're studying. Oh, Kija, you just said something. There's a video that was uploaded a week ago or so with Claire Wendling showing her sketchbook and she even does a sketch at the end. Oh, I'll have to look for that. Thank you for bringing that up. That's awesome. Um, is it in relation to Lightbox happening? The Lightbox, Lightbox Expo, was it a promotional for that? Um, last year, if you don't know what Lightbox Expo is, if you're watching um, and you have no idea what I'm talking about, Lightbox, Expo is uh, like a, a convention for illustrators and um, there's just some amazing art and some really great panels um, that you can attend. So of course this year it's going to be digital, um, but it's like I, I always save money up for expos like this, for conventions like that, because then I can buy art directly from some of the best illustrators in the world. And last year I went, I got some Claire Wendling books and she was there and when she signs your book, she draws a little drawing in it. It's just so cool. It's like my treasure. Um, again, I, I can see comments. I just don't know how many people are watching this live. So if you're here live, and even if you watch this later as a replay, you can put it as a comment. I'd love to know um, what living artists, are there any that you just really love and you just um, enjoy looking at their art? So Claire Wendling would be one for me. I, I think last week we talked about um, dead artists, or a couple weeks ago we talked about dead artists who inspire us. Um, but if there are any living artists, who do you look to? I guess, um, is this an illustration kind of a crowd or fine art kind of a crowd? So I tell you another one. So I, I really enjoy um, illustration. And another artist that I love, he's from Canada. I think his name is um, J.B. Monge, um, Jean-Baptiste. Really good. And another artist, just kind of sticking with the light box theme, another artist who I discovered last year is a um, young woman. Her name is Elise, Marie Elise Arell. I would definitely check her out if I were you guys. It's beautiful watercolor il illustrations. And she does horses, so of course, had to buy the horse drawing book. Her little horse illustrations are so heartwarming.
So next week we do portraits. If there's a specific area they'd like me to focus on, tell me now. Um, you can tell me through my email. So if you're on my email list, you can um, tell me by replying to my email. If you're not, you can get on my email list. Um, there's a link on the video description below. Um, or you can tell me in the comments here. Like we're doing portraits and every, every session has a different focus. So last time we did portraits, we focused on value, uh, in particular value with kind of unclear lighting situations, using kind of cross contour hatching to build value. That's what we focused on last time. And I was planning on focusing on features for the next portrait session. So you know how we're focusing just on hands? So kind of teasing out just one element. So maybe just do noses, you know? Um, so if there's a preference, you can let me know in the comments. Because in the end, this is not so much about me as it is about you. I want you to feel like this is your place that you can come to and have some encouragement to draw. Something that benefits you. time left on this okay we have two th almost three minutes left on this one what am I gonna do with all this time so I don't know if you noticed um, once I'm done with my construction phase uh, and I'm done with my contours, um, I usually get into mapping out my shadow patterns. So when I look at shadow patterns, I begin with the edges of the shadow pattern, never the value variations within the shadows. Let's take out some of the underdrawing here and build some midtones, and then I'll call it a night. So when I build mid-tone, I basically think cross-contour. I want to make sure that it's lighter than any of my shadows. So see how my marks take? They're basically going in a way as if I'm wrapping around a cylinder. And if that starts to look too um, feathery for your taste, you can run your finger across it, especially if it's just a short drawing. If this was like a multi-hour drawing, I would never put my finger in there to, to smudge. I would use a blending stump or a paper towel wrapped around my finger to blend, but you know, for these quick exercises. It's a quick way because then what you can do, let's do this, you can then come back in here and re-erase or build like a little highlight. So 
I'm not liking this pencil. I can't erase it very well. They're like it always leaves um, like a faint ghost. So I need to kind of file that information away. Anytime that I want to demonstrate some value work, I shouldn't use this material. My three minutes are probably over. Let me just wrap this up. And see, now that I've built my midtones, notice how they're almost the same as my shadow pattern. Last thing is I'll restate my shadow pattern. So there's really no conflict between the two. There should be no question about what is shadow and what is midtone. All right. Well, let's see what the time is on here. Yep, the video of the hands are has finished. So let me switch over here real quick. Just need that one. All right, well, I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something. Um, if you wanna share your drawings with me, I'd love to see them. So if you're on Instagram, you can just tag me at Cura Studios and um, you can also send me just a DM on Instagram if you don't wanna post it on your, on your um, feed. Um, you can also email it to me if you're, again, if you're on my email list, just hit reply to one of my emails. Um, if you're not, you should, get on over here. That's where I talk to all my friends and you get weekly emails, um, creativity tips, drawing tips. It always lets you know what's on tap for the next sketch session. Anything else fun that I have coming down the pipelines, you'll know about it first if you're on the email list. And so again, the link for that is below this video and you'll get a free workbook, um, how to make your drawings better with three simple questions. And um, you get that into your inbox and like that, we'll hear from each other a little bit more. I'd love to um, have the honor of being in your inbox. Um, other than that, um, there don't seem to be any questions unless I overlooked anything. No, I don't see anything. Um, again, let me know what you want to focus on for portraits next week. Share your artwork with me. It's been so fun drawing and I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.